Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to the Off Farm Income Podcast YouTube channel. Hey, this is Matt Breckwald. You are here for episode number 712 of the Off Farm Income Podcast. This is one of our Friday edition episodes, and we are exploring our new format today. We're going to talk agriculture with a young man named Josh Dowell. Now, this is a young man who I ran across on LinkedIn. And the tagline on his LinkedIn page says, Discovering the Nexus of Agriculture, Government, and Entrepreneurship. And this is just something I had to know more about. So we're going to talk quite a bit about entrepreneurship as normal in this interview. But we're going to talk about much, much more as well as his journey and his vision for the future and how he wants to reach it in agriculture. And he's also got a very interesting take on California and where he sees California going and why he is sticking it out in the Golden State. We'll have this starting for you right now. Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. Hey, you bet. You know, you're. Uh, I, guess, I think you're my first guest in kind of my new format of the way I'm doing things on the show, uh, where I'm, I'm kind of branching out and we're telling stories that maybe go a little beyond or a different direction than entrepreneurship. And I, I know we're going to talk about both with you, but really appreciate you being willing to come on and do this. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to be one of the first ones. That's exciting. Okay. Well, so this is what, this is what drew me to this interview. This is why I wanted to talk to you. And, and I've talked about the power of LinkedIn on this show before, and I think you're going to be able to attest to that as well. But as I was, I was going through all my LinkedIn connections the other day, and I was wanting to send out some information to certain people that I was connected to on LinkedIn. And as I was scrolling through those people, I came across your name and I looked at your tagline. And I don't know if this was your tagline on LinkedIn prior to to me, I, I guess the first time we connected, or if this is something you've changed since then. But what it says is discovering the nexus of agriculture, government, and entrepreneurship. And I could not be more intrigued by what that means and, and what you meant by that. So that's really what drew me to want to connect with you and, and have you on the show and kind of talk about that. And we're kind of just jumping into this and just having a conversation, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I will say that I actually changed that fairly recently. Um, I was working a position with a tech startup and then I kind of saw this new opportunity based on the, the background experiences that I've had in government farmers that were engaged in that governmental and policy process. So I thought it was just something attractive that would pique interest, and apparently it's working. <laughs> well, it definitely caught my eye. Uh, certainly the word entrepreneurship always grabs me, but uh, this nexus is really interesting, so I'm going to want to get to that. Let's do this. Let's start mm -hmm. off by just giving a little bit of background about you. So, Josh, tell us where you grew up and how you grew up. Yeah, so... I grew up on a dairy farm in Chowchilla, California. So it was a, a family run operation. Uh, my uncle had one. My great grandparents were farmers in, mm -hmm. you know, the Chowchilla region, um, as well as Riverdale, California. And it was an awesome opportunity. I mean, I got to grow up, uh, feeding calves every day, working with cattle. And it was just something that I loved. Unfortunately, that dairy due to the economic conditions that were created back in 2008, and 2009, uh, we got ahead of it, and we moved the dairy operation to Texas, which would mean it's a lot further away from me, uh, mm -hmm. still residing in California. But I was still able to go back every once in a while and be a part of that. But that's how I grew up. And on top of that, uh, I was really you know, invested in 4-H and FFA projects, uh, was a member of the Minarets FFA chapter, and had just, it, I mean, it was an absolute blast. Growing up, where I got to grow up and how I did was, I mean, I, I wouldn't have asked for anything differently. Okay. Now, how old are you now? So I actually just turned 24 in September, so I'm still pretty young. Okay. So you're just getting, you're getting started into what is going to eventually be what you describe as your career field or your, your career path. Exactly. Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. So growing up in Chowchilla, so I don't know if you know this about me, I grew up in Stanislaus County. So Chowchilla is in Merced County, I believe, just one county to the south and right on Highway 99, right? Yes. And it's, it's Madera County. It's just across the Oh, just Madera across County the line. Okay. So Madera County. Okay. Yeah. I used to stop in yep. Madera on my way to Fresno with the Bob's Big Boy 
I always like to go there. I have yep. a burger. Yeah, okay. There you go. <laughs> okay, well, that was years ago, years ago. So, very good. So, I understand the area that you grew up in. So, so tell me what happened. So, when did, so in 2008, 2009, that's when the dairy got moved from the San Joaquin Valley to Texas? Yes. And where in Texas did it go to, do you know? So, yeah, we moved the, de- uh, the dairy to Bailey County in a little town called Muleshoe. Okay. I don't know what it is, but every person I've ever met from Texas knows exactly where Meals Shoe is, <laughs> even though it's only about 5,000 people. Okay. Yeah, I love Texas. I'll have to look that up. I'm planning on heading down there here in a couple months. But So the, the dairy moved, and once the dairy mm-hmm. moved, and so you're 24 now, so we're looking at 10 years ago. So you were in your early teens when this occurred. Yes, just starting in high school. Okay. Now, you mentioned the FFA. So when uh-huh. were you an FFA member throughout your high school career? Yes, I was. And I was it was the Mineral FFA chapter. And because the dairy had moved on, uh, something that we did at the dairy, we had, you know, big dairy lagoons and there was always a, a massive weed overgrowth. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my grandparents actually went down to the local sale yard and bought about 20 goats that were just run of the mill weed eating goats. Okay. Uh, and we actually turned that into a full blown, uh, I, I guess you could say small business. I mean, we were actually going back and forth between Texas, shipping goats back and forth, breeding them to, you know, get a better genetic return on what we had, okay. uh, and eventually start selling them as show stock. So there was one point that we had almost 300 of them. And I, I can say when you've got 300 goats, uh, life gets a little stressful at, you know, 14, 15, yeah, that is a lot. That's a lot of goats, a lot of kids every year. Yeah, it, huge numbers. Very cool. Well, you've got a neighbor just to the south of you there, in, or north of you there in Merced. I just interviewed a while back, just won the uh, American Star Farmer, Willis Wolf, and he did that with goats right there in the Central Valley. Uh, so very I cool. I just saw that. Yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. First one since 1952 out of California. Oh, is that right? I didn't realize I for Star Farmer, it went back that far. Very interesting. Yeah, it, yeah, it's been almost seventy years. I mean, it's incredible that he won. I, I'm really happy to say he's Californian. Well, I had the pleasure of interviewing him, and he has taken a concept that I've thought of before, but he has just ten xed it. With he's got goats just spread out all over Merced County, some in Stanislaus County, and he is raising a ton of goats down there. And he's got some big plans for the future. It was pretty cool to uh, to do that interview and yeah. find out what he's doing. Well, so very cool. So were goats your project, your SAE, during your time in FFA? Yeah, it was in FFA. It was going to be your your market meat goats. Uh, And then I also stayed in that kind of connected cattle thing. uh, And I actually made the jump over into beef cattle because my aunt had a small little herd of red Angus. Okay. Okay, very cool. So you did that, obviously, four years of high school, and did you graduate then in 2012, 2013? Have I got my math straight here? 2013. That was the year I graduated. Okay, so 2013, and then where did you go next? What was after high school? So after high school, uh, I became one of the one of the greats. I became a Fresno State Bulldog. Okay. Um, I know that's a little controversial for some, especially if we've got some Cal Poly folk, you know. It's Okay. <laughs> But uh, I, I have to poke fun. But yeah, I went to Fresno State for, uh, it was four and a half years. And my major, uh, when I originally started, I really thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. Okay. Uh, and then I kind of find out how much debt I was going to have to take on in order to achieve that dream. Uh, and I, I took a long, hard look in the mirror and said, I really don't want to be in debt till I'm 50. Um, so I shifted gears and I decided to study entrepreneurship, but I wanted an ag emphasis. And I spoke with one of my professors, who's my academic advisor, and said, I really want to do an ag entrepreneurship type thing, but the ag business program doesn't have the flexibility for it. What do I do? Mm-hmm. And they recommended that I became an ag communications major because that was still a relatively young one. There was a defined paths of classes that you had to take. And I was able to pull some of that comms material out and replace it with uh, business, business management, entrepreneurship courses through the Lyle Center uh, at Fresno State. And, I mean, I really came out with an ad comms degree and almost a minor in entrepreneurship. It's not an official minor, but with the amount of coursework I did in that, uh, that's what I fell in love with. 
Well, I mean, that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. You don't need a piece of paper saying that you are one. You just go out and prove it, right? Exactly. And I'm working on that. I'm still young, <laughs> but I'm giving it a shot. Okay. Now, what drew you? What drew you? Well, first of all, let me back up. I always, anybody who brings this up, I bring this up. I started out pre vet myself. It wasn't the debt that scared me away, it was the lack of brain power that I was bringing to the table that scared me away. So that's what scared me away from trying to go to vet school. But uh, I started out the same way. I wound up with an animal science degree. But what led you to entrepreneurship? Where, where did this come from? Uh, I, I think it really came down to looking back, uh, you know, since the dairy left in about 2008, 2009, uh, taking that moment to step back after one, I, I left out one component. My grandparents decided it was time to come home to California right before I completed high school. So they, uh, after building a new facility and operating it for a few years, you know, moved back to California, sold the one in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of watched that, uh, that identity that I had as a kid, it, it was, it was gone. Uh, and that there wouldn't be a chance to go and, you know, feed the calves in the morning and have that sense of pride in the family business. Okay. Uh, so I saw it just as, you know, not in a detrimental way. It was just, it was time to get innovative and find the next thing. So, uh, when I'm in my seventies and I've got, you know, multiple grandchildren, excuse me, grandchildren, like my, you know, my grandparents do, mm -hmm. uh, they can have that same kind of lifestyle, that same upbringing that I got, because I mean, it taught me everything I know. I, I always say that, that, you know, milking cows is what put clothes on my back and books on my table. That's what got me through Fresno State. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've been really attracted to entrepreneurship ever since because I see it as one of the only viable avenues uh, that you can find success at a scale that you could actually go back into something like that with the cost of land and the cost of just doing business mm -hmm. in California. Interesting. So when your grandparents came back, they were out of the dairy industry or did they reinvest back into the dairy industry in the Central Valley? Completely out of the dairy industry. The, the okay. investments they made back, we were partners in some almonds now, mm -hmm. which is what, you know, they say every good dairy farmer is getting into. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. yeah. So we have some trees and actually the, the original dairy that my great grandfather farmed out of when they first came to Chowchilla mm -hmm. uh, is the pat, it was a pasture facility so the pastures actually are now an almond orchard, but the original barn uh, is still there in Chowchilla, and you know the, the original mm -hmm. homestead is all still there. So it's it's nice to at least have that one piece. Yeah, you know it's pretty interesting down there. Uh, when I was I went to Modesto Junior College in Modesto for three semesters uh, before I went up to Montana uh -huh. State University and. I took dairy science, and back then, California was the number one dairy state in the nation. And I think California probably still is in terms of raw numbers of, of pounds mm -hmm. of milk and, and dairy cattle uh, and just those, those raw numbers. And surely the, you know, the scope and the size of the state has a lot to do with that. But it is interesting how many dairy farmers, especially looking at the fluctuations in the dairy industry, who have that opportunity to move over to those permanent crops that are so valuable, like almonds and walnuts and things like that there in California are doing that. And it, it makes me wonder, even though California is such a big state geographically, if at some point they will cease to be the number one dairy state because so many so many farm, dairy farmers are going to convert over to those permanent crops. Yeah, and I, I think you're actually spot on. It, it's sad to think and say, but it's, I don't think we've had a, a time in the dairy industry in the last decade uh, where, you know, there, there's ups and downs in every ag market. Um, almonds obviously had a huge skyrocket in 2014 and 15, and mm -hmm. that's what's attracted a lot of people into it. Sure. But dairy just hasn't had a massive upswing in a long time, especially in California. Um, I do know that we were the, when we moved the dairy to Texas, we were the third in Bailey County. Uh, and I, I don't know the facts and figures on how many came from California or from other states, mm -hmm. uh, but I do know that there's over 20 dairies in that county now. Okay. Yeah, well, where I sit today in Idaho, uh, I think we're the number three dairy state now, and that is, I think that's almost 100% of California dairies moving up here uh, for, for, various, yep. for various reasons. Okay, interesting. Yep. Okay, so let's talk, about, let's talk about college more. And by the way, 
Uh, by the way, uh, not from a ag school rivalry standpoint, but from a sports rivalry standpoint, I live just outside of Boise, Idaho, and that has turned into a huge sports rivalry <laughs> <laughs> between Boise State and Fresno State. So that's always fun. I've got all my cousins on my mom's side uh, have gone to Fresno State and still live down there. So that's always a lot uh -huh. of fun, at least when BSU wins. It's always a lot of fun uh, for me. Yeah. Well, good thing we're not playing this year because <laughs> Fresno State's not looking too hot. I know. I know. Well, okay, so let's talk about learning entrepreneurship in college. So that's really interesting to me. You go into college, you're taking a course of study, you're going to get a degree, you want to learn about entrepreneurship. Now, there's a lot of people out there who would say the way you learn about entrepreneurship is getting out there and starting a business and getting going. What what can you learn in college that, that prepares you for that journey? So... The, the coursework wise, I mean, obviously they can put together a course on anything and they can, you know, teach you the theories. Um, the uniqueness at Fresno State is they, Fresno State is they have the Lyle Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And that's a center on campus that was started um, kind of to foster that entrepreneurial spirit uh, among students and staff, faculty. But they have a program within it. It's called the Claude Laval. Uh, entrepreneurship mentor program. And really that's when my gears started turning uh, to want to be a business owner one day was when I joined that program because Claude Laval started the Claude Laval Corporation. He still lives in Fresno, mm -hmm. uh, but that company is now known by Laco Filtration. Um, so they have an environment that Claude Laval has helped Fresno State create where they actually take about 20 students a year and they take them to the sites of business owners, of Fresno State grads that are business, uh, business owners, influencers in the community, and actually allow you to see what a business looks like on the ground floor. I mean, we got the opportunities uh, to see construction, uh, almond processing, I mean, dozens of different things. But it's a beautiful program because it also connects you to a mentor and that mentor is typically somebody that's found success in business, whether it's entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship. Mm -hmm. So, you know, working inside of a corporation, but kind of looking at it as their own business. Mm -hmm. uh, and they connect you with that mentor and that mentor, you know, it's a, it's a voluntary thing between the student and the mentor, but you share ideas. They help you to foster your ideas into a successful one or, you know, in entrepreneurship we don't know if the idea is going to be a success until we test it. And mm -hmm. they help us to best uh, position ourselves to find it. So it's, it's just a really unique program. And it, it definitely, after doing a year in that, I mean, I still go back, uh, Dr. Timothy Stern, he's, he's not an Aggie by any means, but he's, he's the gentleman that runs the program at Fresno state. Mm -hmm. And he just absolutely blew the lid off of what my perceived reality of a college education could be. Cool. Okay. And so your, your, I guess the catalyst for you choosing entrepreneurship or looking at that as your path is you're trying to find a pathway back to farming and ranching. You want to live that life again and you want to pass that tradition along to uh, your future children, your future grandchildren. And because of the obstacles, mostly financial, of getting into farming mm -hmm. and ranching, you're looking at entrepreneurship as the way that you're going to be able to generate enough capital to make that happen. Am I understanding that correct? Absolutely. Um, land is not cheap in California. And the, the, you know, there's no nine to five job that, that I have found yet mm -hmm. that will provide the kind of resources you need to, to have any substantial uh, amount of ground to be a farmer. Interesting. Well, and I'll tell you, land's not cheap anywhere, honestly. I mean, there's some places yeah. where where you can do okay, and that's what we always talk about on this show is that when you do get out to those areas where land is at least reflects its production capability, meaning you can buy land that is priced based on how much you can earn off of that land, then you get out there and mm -hmm. there's there's no way, you know, there's not a lot of jobs. And so how are you going to support that exactly. land payment, equipment, you know, overhead, all of that, and that's where that's why I talk about entrepreneurship to give people that opportunity to do that. But it's interesting that you're choosing it for this reason. Uh, just a quick anecdote for you. There's a mentor of mine. Uh, his name is Dan Miller, and he's got a podcast uh -huh. called the Forty Eight Days Internet Radio Show. And his story is really interesting in that he had started a a gym, like a fitness center, 
and got into it was trouble with taxes and found themselves uh, with five or six hundred thousand dollars in tax debt and the business gone and and this and that and he was faced with the decision kind of like what you're looking at from a financial standpoint which was do I go out and get a job that pays me seventy or eighty thousand dollars a year and eventually one day I will pay off this tax debt or do I go out mm-hmm. and I, I take a risk and I start a business to give me the ability to actually get unburied from this massive amount of tax debt and be able to move on with my life from this. And so he chose entrepreneurship for the exact same reasons you're choosing it, uh, not for agriculture, but uh, because he was looking at, at something that was really capital intense and that was the best path yep. forward to, to, to getting there in, in his opinion. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, I mean, it's, it's not a tax debt for me, but, uh, if you, if you want to have a 2000 cow dairy, you got to have a few million bucks. (laughs) That's right. Okay. Very interesting. So that's why you're choosing entrepreneurship. Now there's more of this to come really quick. I got to do a quick break for one of my sponsors, Josh. I'm sure this is a company you're familiar with working in the cattle industry and California, but everybody I'm talking about powder river livestock handling equipment, of course, I uh, want to make sure you're all going over to PowderRiver.com, seeing some of the innovative things they are doing. I just saw a new ad for them on Facebook over the weekend where they created a deer gate, a wildlife gate, to keep wildlife from jumping over your gates in areas where you're trying to keep wildlife out, namely deer. Uh, really interesting stuff they've come up with. But, of course, they have been developing livestock handling equipment since over 80 years ago designed to handle the roughest, the toughest, and the most wild cattle that we have out there. And certainly they have developed equipment that are going to handle all of your cattle and reduce stress, reduce potential for injury for both animal and handler. So please go over to powderriver.com, check out what they've got to offer, and let your local farm and ranch retailer know you'd like to see Powder River equipment in their sales yard. All right, Josh. So I, you know, out in the West, everybody seems to have heard of Powder River. Are you familiar with my, with my sponsor? Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, great stuff. I use them here on my place, and always an honor to be able to recommend them uh, for anyone running cattle. Well, let's let's come back to your journey. So uh, we've talked about college. We've talked about the emphasis for choosing entrepreneurship. What year did you graduate from Fresno State? So I left Fresno State in December of 2017. So we actually are coming up on two years out here okay. in, in just about 30 days. Okay, very good. What was next? What ha- what was after Fresno State for you? So I actually, I took a job while I was still in my, my last six months at Fresno State with a technology startup that was based in the Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were an organization that was looking to deploy IoT technology uh, to kind of best optimize the use of water in California because we have so many issues, uh, especially in the southern, you know, Central Valley, Mm -hmm. um, urban water issues. And we really were looking for a a strategy to best deploy technology to kind of bridge that gap. So I was able to work with them uh, up until July of this year, but decided it was time to, to move on and try to find the next step. Um, but again, it, it really was all about that entrepreneurial kind of journey because it was a startup and mm-hmm. I was, I was trying to be engaged in that culture. And there's an interesting thing about California too. I mean, I grew up in Chowchilla, which is just off of the 152 highway corridor. Mm-hmm. And 152 is the corridor that takes you over the coastal mountains by the San Luis Reservoir and dumps you into Gilroy, which has kind of almost become the south tip of the Silicon Valley. Okay. And the the geography isn't, you know, it's only a two-hour drive, but the world couldn't be, uh, you know, more polar. Sure. Silicon Valley is very big tech, and then Chowchilla is a rural, small uh, agrarian society. So uh, it was a great opportunity to get from, you know, that, that small town, I mean, there's, there's lots of things that, you know, and I'll just say it in the best way I know it. Um, I mean, all of us have gone to high school and all of us have seen those classmates that get stuck kind of where they are and don't think there's a way out, Mm -hmm. but, uh, with the right kind of thought process and the right challenge to yourself, you can end up in in a place like the Silicon Valley. I mean, the largest collection of venture capital on the planet. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was, that was my next step. 
And I mean, it was an absolute blessing. I loved every minute of it. It was great. I was actually able to work in the Imperial Valley, which was a growing region I'd never been to before, Mm -hmm. uh, as well as in the rice industry. And that's kind of something that I'm taking as my my next uh, journey down the road because it's just a very unique crop in California. Yep. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what came after Fresno State. Man, talk about a contrast. So the Imperial Valley for everybody who is listening, we're talking Yuma, Arizona, or that area, right? Yeah. So Yuma, Yuma, Arizona is on the Arizona side, uh-huh. but that's El Centro, California, Brawley, uh, Holtville. I, you know, I'm going to miss some of the small towns. So if you have yeah. Imperial Valley listeners, I do apologize, <laughs> but yeah. But we're talking right on, we're right on the Mexican and Arizona border in Southeastern California. Yes. Yeah. And, and un- unbelievable agriculture down there. I had one of my first internships in college. I was selling ag chemicals for Zeneca ag products. That was the name of the company back then. And my boss had just come up to the Treasure Valley of Idaho where I live now, which is a ironic twist of fate because this is not where I'm from and not where I was going to college but I was doing the six-month internship here working for him but he had just come up from the Imperial Valley and he talked about the farming down there because uh, with irrigation water in that climate he said you know basically it was perfect growing conditions because they had control over their water input but they never had really unwanted weather because uh, essentially it's a desert and they were able to cultivate it with irrigation so interesting area very yeah i mean i uh, probably it, on an acre by acre basis the most productive land in california because mm-hmm. you have a you have a 12 a 12 month growing season yeah. it's just incredible yeah well and it's interesting that you're you're looking at the rice industry where i grew up i grew up in a really small town called valley home with it, which is north of oakdale in stanislaus mm-hmm. county and when i was a kid everybody there that farmed if it wasn't dairy it was rice yeah, and the foothills, we had guys that were ranching beef. But really, if it wasn't yep. dairy, it was rice. And now all those rice fields are gone, and they've all been replaced with orchards. But uh, there's, yep. there's still uh, still rice farming going on in California, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so on, on your LinkedIn page, it says you're in the Sacramento, California area, and I know that they grow rice up in that Delta area. I'm assuming that's why you're there, based on what you said. Am I right about that? Yeah, that's that's part of the reason I'm here. So really, your, your southernmost tip of the rice industry in California now is just outside of Sacramento. It's kind of in the Pleasant Grove region, which is a small town. Nicholas is another one up there that's a little bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, and it goes all the way up, you know, north of Glynn County, up into Orland Chico area. And they farm rice along the Sacramento kind of river shed. So okay. the the vein of California's water system, which is coming out of Lake Shasta way up at the top, uh, the rice industry is downstream from it. And it's it's a unique industry in the fact that the bulk of California's water flows through their fields mm-hmm. uh, and then out into the delta where it's either pumped south or, you know, what whatever the current circumstances are. So. I found it to be very unique in that regard. And also it's just, it's an aquatic environment uh, that it, it's just, it's a unique crop. It's unlike anything else we grow here in California. Okay. Now how did you get involved in, in rice farming? What, what led you to this? So the, the way I got involved was actually in my time at the first company I worked for mm-hmm. uh, the tech startup. I had a good friend of mine who was a friend from the SSA days and the Fresno state days uh, his name is Tino. Tino got me connected with a rice farmer that he knew up here and was friends with. And we did a little bit of business with the, uh, with the tech startup, mm-hmm. but it was really intriguing to me to see the, the, the level of scale that the rice industry operates at and the way that that just, you know, one rice plant um, is almost kind of like the base unit of the entire economy of Northern California, because mm-hmm. rice is the number of, you know, the number one consumed crop on the planet. It's the number one grown. Um, and the level of production that we have in California, uh, I, I've been able to learn. I talked to uh, a rice farmer from India, it was South, Southwest India, and they said that they were getting about 300 kilograms per acre of rice yield. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a great mathematician when it comes to conversions, but 
I know up here in the Sacramento Valley, we're looking at 11,000 pounds an acre. So really understanding what the mechanization has done, the scale that they operate at, and what that industry is capable of doing on a half a million acres, Mm -hmm. it's just phenomenal, and it it fascinates me. Okay, very cool. Now, on your LinkedIn page, uh, your tagline again is discovering the nexus of agriculture, government, and entrepreneurship. We're covering agriculture. We're covering entrepreneurship. We haven't talked about government. Why is this included here? So I actually had the opportunity at Fresno State. I did a couple of internships uh, in elected official offices. Mm -hmm. I saw it as a good catalyst to meet other people around the communities that I was living in. But also with the level of regulation, this kind of all goes back to the dairy days, but the level of regulation that's against the dairy industry with the the massive difference in population. I mean, California's got almost 40 million people Mm -hmm. and 80,000 are farmers. Uh, when we get to a ballot box, if if we aren't fighting for our way of life, 80,000 against 40 million, just the math doesn't add up. Uh, so through those internships with elected officials, I kind of saw this unique world where being engaged in the governmental process, you know, talking to those that are, are voting on issues that can become law in our state and in our nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, is critical to the survival of agriculture. I mean, we're we're in a society now where one percent of the people that live in it grow the food that feeds the entire thing. Yeah. And it's just it's it's sad to think it's that way, but that's where we're at and we need to be engaged. We have to keep pushing the ball forward for ourselves. It's not just sit back, uh, be humble because we feed the world. It really comes down to the fact that we have to be engaged in this process or we are not going to be able to uh, survive in the capacities that we are. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. How will you – well, let's talk about this really quick. So you you talk about the nexus. So let's jump into that really quick. So with what you're saying, and and I get it, we need to be actively involved and we need to be pushing for and promoting pro-agriculture, pro-farming legislation. We don't want to be regulated out of what we do and and the ability to feed yep. or the ability to innovate so we can feed the in ever-increasing number of people that are going to be walking on the face of this earth. So I get yep. that part of it. Tell me about this nexus. What is then the nexus, or have you found it? It says you're discovering, so maybe you haven't discovered it completely yet. Uh, but the the nexus of agriculture, government, and entrepreneurship, what is that, or what do you think it is? So I like I said, I am discovering it. I'm not entirely sure where it all comes together yet. But there, the, the uniqueness of an entrepreneur, um, you know, just kind of going down to the, the very base level in the way that I think about this, mm-hmm. uh, the entrepreneur is somebody that can create positive economic impact for those around him. So when somebody decides to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur rather than just a, a standard employee, that person's making a conscious decision that they're going to go into business for themselves and typically – you know, not in all cases, they're going to be hiring employees, which means they're actually paying out money that they're generating through their uh, enterprise back into the economy. And when we look at that, uh, an employee is going to go spend their money on their house payment, on food, on, you know, going out with the kids, going to Mm -hmm. a movie. Um, And I think that that's really important that in a rural environment where we have such a shortage of jobs, uh, I mean, again, California, massive state, but the income disparity and jobs market from the inland of the valley to the coast is just, I mean, it's, it's night and day. Yeah. Uh, and looking at that problem, I, I see a path where innovators that specifically work in ag, uh, and that doesn't mean a production farm, but they are doing things that can positively, but uh, you know, benefit producers. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's an absolutely critical bridge to cross. And I think that third one, is engagement in the governmental process. And when I say just government, I don't mean, you know, just going in and talking to your legislator Mm -hmm. uh, on why the issue is specific, but really organizing, we've seen it deployed very, very well by animal rights groups. Um, You know, the PETAs and HSUSs, they use a lot of emotion to generate their grassroots campaigns. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying we need to use emotion, but we need to do a better job of grassroots organizations with organizing within agriculture. 
because the entities that seek to regulate us or push us out of existence are very, very, very good at it. And if we don't take a step back and understand how we can create a, you know, a positive economic impact in our communities to get them, you know, to get the pulse back Mm -hmm. and then take that a step further and show larger urban environments, why we are absolutely critical to their survival. Um, We are just fighting a losing battle and we're putting out fires rather than being proactive. Sure. Uh, And I, I see that. I see the the ladder in front of me. I don't know exactly where the rungs are yet, Mm -hmm. but that's why I've been, you know, I've, I've done lobbying uh, with specific ag entities and then educational ones that I was a part of at Fresno state got to work in legislators offices. Uh, I did have a good friend of mine who's also a rice farmer. He decided that he was going to run for Congress and I was managing his campaign until some, you know, outside circumstances have made him decide that he needs to take a step back for a, a time mm-hmm. being. We're not sure if we're going to be able to make this run. Mm-hmm. Uh, but really it's all circling around everything. I grew up learning in ag and the fact that I want to be an entrepreneur, but I really need to take into focus everything that's going on in California, everything that's going on in the United States and then everything that's going on around the world uh, if we really want to see substantive change and, you know, a, a new era of ag, instead of us saying, oh, the, the man's coming down on us, how do we form a strategic partnership with those environmental groups? Mm-hmm. And, and I will say, though, uh, rice is also very appealing because they're an industry that about 20 years ago decided they were going to be working with environmental groups like the Sierra Club and Ducks Unlimited. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have a very good working relationship and a symbiotic relationship that actually makes them one of the least targeted crops by environmental groups. So I I want to to learn that strategy Mm -hmm. and see how we can push it across to other commodities in ag in California. Very cool. Wow, that's really insightful. And uh, yeah, I think you're spot on too in terms of the the sportsmen's groups and uh, the environmental groups, with all that water that goes into rice farming, there's a there's a lot of other opportunities that come in there as well. Absolutely, interesting stuff. Okay, so off the air when we were talking, uh, you mentioned that you're actively seeking new opportunities. Now I want to give you an I want to give you a chance to pitch yourself here really quick. So we're going to do that, but I'm going to warn you. I've got a follow up question for you coming. I'm going to challenge you on that a little bit. Okay. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> okay. Why don't you go ahead and do that yeah. real quick? Tell me what you're looking for right now, what kind of opportunities that you're seeking. Yeah, so when it when it comes down to it, I'm I'm looking for opportunities. Uh the role that I served the tech company was a sales role. Mm-hmm. Um and I'm I'm kind of looking for that because again, going all the way back to the entrepreneurship thing, uh I like to be able to be able to do something more and create a, a more uh, substantive effort to get back to that point where I want to be a farmer. So sales jobs are really what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. And I've got the experience, uh, of being an ag in the central Valley, seeing it in the Sacramento Valley, Imperial Valley, the coastal range, and then also working in the Silicon Valley. I mean, I'm I'm only a 24 year old guy, but not many 24 year olds have been able to take all of that on in 24 months. So I'm looking for something that, you know, if it's an innovator, if it's somebody that has a new biotech idea, uh, anywhere that I can help to affect positive change mm-hmm. and really get back to that, you know, that what I talked about is a, affecting those rural communities and engaging with them. I mean, I'm all in. And if there's a bridge that's down the road, I absolutely want to cross it. Okay. Very good. So you've got a clear idea of where you want to go. Now, here's how I want to challenge you. I want to ask you about this. You're talking about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, meaning you're going to start your own venture and that Mm -hmm. venture is what ultimately is going to fund uh, your ability to get back into agriculture on the scale and in the manner in which uh, you want to be. So with that being the case, why are you seeking opportunities with other employers rather than going out and creating your own right now? Great question. And, and I actually have a bit of a, a decent answer for you, I hope. <laughs> okay. The, the, the reason that I'm looking to work with other folks is, is that 
uh, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, I'm only 24 years old. Mm -hmm. I I don't for a moment think that I'm not capable. Uh, But I do recognize that I don't know what I don't know. Okay. And working with employers and bringing, you know, positive benefits to those that I interact with and network with, uh, I see it as an opportunity to not only gain skills and gain insight, but really to grow that network of people that an entrepreneur really, really depends on. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, I mean, I'm 24 years old. I was lucky that I didn't graduate with any student debt from Fresno State. But in order to make that happen, uh, I had to make a lot of financial sacrifices. So it's not as easy for me as a 24-year-old to just say, hey, I'm going to run with 12 months of no paycheck in order to make something go off. When Mm -hmm. I, you know, I live in Sacramento, it's basically the Eastern Bay area at this point. Uh, so it's, it's really looking to find something that's going to keep the lights on. I can provide a positive benefit to an employer and then build a network with that employer. Um, I mean, I, I will say that I do have things going on in the background that I don't want to dive too much into, but I am working with groups that would be interested in investing in ideas that me and some friends and old networks uh, have. Mm -hmm. But I need something for the time being to continue to refine that skill set. And ultimately, I I mean, I just being fully transparent. I'm a young guy. I just need to pay my bills. (laughs) Uh, That's that's being 100% honest. But if I can provide a positive benefit to someone uh, and in return my lights stay on, I absolutely want to take part in it. Awesome. Well, that's a great answer, and there's certainly nothing wrong with learning the trade and in, in discovering what it is that is going to be your opportunity before you jump in. But I think that's a question that needs to be asked, right? You're you're being very wise, I oh, think. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're being really wise in, in terms of how you're going about it. You're out there, you're learning, um, you're meeting people, you're networking, you're doing all of these things that you're going to need to ultimately start and succeed in your own venture when that does happen, I would assume. Yep. And it's, it's just a work in progress. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. The journey is not the destination. It is the journey (laughs) itself. And the journey's fun. Enjoy it while you're on it because it it is a, it is a good time. Yeah. I've been enjoying the heck out of it right now. I mean, like I said, I've, I've moved up and down California twice Uh uh, in the, the span of 12 months. I was living in El Centro, seven miles from the Mexican border. Now I'm in Sacramento. I'm only an hour out of San Francisco. So it's just, it's been an interesting, paradigm to be a part of now let me ask you when you were when you were in the silicon valley and even now in sacramento do you do you run into i I'll, i'm not even going to say many i'm going to say any do you run into any other people working in these environments these tech environments uh you know uh, these types of places who are who have the same motivation as you which is one day to be able to afford to start a large-scale farm a production agriculture type farm and to go back to it Um, you know, if I was to say absolutely not, I think I would be a liar because I'm sure in there, there's someone else that I've yet to meet that's doing the same exact thing. Uh Um, but I will say that they are few and far between. Uh, I do know that the, the founder of the company that I worked at, uh, his whole, you know, idea behind the company was that Mm -hmm. he grew up in India and his father was an employee with the UN. Uh, and he did some time in Africa, I believe it was Nigeria and Uganda, and he saw firsthand growing up where he grew up um, what water scarcity leads to and what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, And his whole mission was to build a company in the most successful economy that's ever existed, which is America, Mm -hmm. that could drive down the cost of his product to the point that he could affect positive change in those communities. So his his you know mission isn't the same as mine but there's a reason to it he he's trying to connect something and fix something uh that he saw as a problem in his early life mm-hmm. and really you know affect positive change from it and that's at the end of the day that's all I want to do too i mean i want to be a farmer because it's part of my identity but the the most humbling thought that you know ties into that is that I'm putting food on the table of people that could really actually be needing it. Yeah. Um, you know, the family that is struggling to keep the lights on and I, I mean, this probably sounds like a very millennial answer, uh, answer, but it, it's really at the end of the day, that's what it is. 
is because I've always had the opportunity to make sure that my belly was full, but I know that there's hundreds of millions of people around the world, probably even billions, Mm -hmm. um, that are around my age, 10 years younger, 10 years older, that don't have that luxury. And how do we find strategies that are, you know, they, they provide economic return and benefit for those who find them. We can't just do everything for free, uh, but also affect positive change. So that's, that's, in a, in a long form, the short answer to what you asked. <laughs> okay. Now, I want to ask you about your uh, the chosen pathway that you've got for achieving your, your farming vision, your farming dreams. And this is something that I struggle with, too. So to tell you a little bit about my story, so I graduated with my degree in agriculture. I didn't have uh, a farm to go back to. And I had done some internships. I didn't necessarily see a job in agriculture at that time that I wanted. So I actually left agriculture. I went to work in 1996 outside of agriculture. And then in Mm -hmm. 2000, or excuse me, then in 2001, I finally purchased a farm. So it took me 15 years to get that done if I'm doing my math right. Um, except I'm wrong. 2011 is when we actually purchased our farm. So it took me 25 years, I guess, to get that done. So we purchased a Mm -hmm. small farm, 25 acre farm. Uh, I've developed the business model on the farm that I, I like and would like to pursue. And now it's just a matter of scaling that up. But for me to Mm -hmm. scale it up, I run into several of the same obstacles that you do just to get started, which is again, I need more land for more livestock. Yep. Uh, There's a barrier there. And so I've chosen entrepreneurship as well as a way for me to generate the capital that will allow me to scale up. And that's that's an everyday effort while I'm enjoying the journey that I'm on with the farm and the operation that I have currently at this moment. But this begs the question, there are people, so you and I are choosing essentially the same path, which is to generate the capital that will allow us to purchase the farm. But then you see folks yep. you see folks that choose the other pathway. And, and a lot of people find their way to success this way. A lot of people don't, which is they start out leasing and they start out and they say, yep. I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm an entrepreneur and I'm staying in farming. I'm staying in agriculture, whether it's livestock, row crop, whatever that may be. And I'm starting out small and I'm building and I'm building and I'm developing and I'm developing and I'm developing. Why do you choose the model of generate the capital, come back to agriculture versus start small and build and grow and build upon? Um, I I think in my most honest answer is that the the reason I chose the path I'm on is because uh, the the security that that plan affords. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that leasing and growing is a bad model by any means, but there is inherent risk. Um, in that. And, you know, if you have a couple of bad years, you could be all the way back at square one. Sure. Um, whereas if you actually have the capital means to go out and purchase the land, you're a little more secure in your business because you don't have to worry about, uh, paying the leaseholder when, you know, when the bill comes due. Um, and I think that's really, that, that's something that's kind of just innate in me. My grandfather has a really good saying, whereas if you can't, if you can't afford to pay for it three times, you probably shouldn't buy it. Okay. Um, yeah, and I just kind of see that in, instead of worrying about those month-to-month bills, mm-hmm. uh, finding a way that you can take on the massive amount of capital, have a little breathing room, have some you know security in your pursuit. Mm-hmm. Uh, because really, at the end of the day, if if you put ten million into farming, I, I mean the jokes you know if you if you want to make a million, you start with ten. Right. But at the end of the day, your land has some value. So you do have a security blanket if you are to fail. And that's kind of the methodology that I've chosen just because really when it all boils down to is I'm trying to provide a, a level of security for future generations in the same way that my grandparents were with the dairy farm. Okay. Um, and that, that's, that's, that's why I think I'm on the path I'm on. Yeah, that's really interesting what you bring up. You and I are very similar in this, and I think what we're talking about is, um, you know, everybody, every entrepreneur, every person, everybody has a, they've got a different level of risk tolerance that they can handle. And and there's Mm -hmm. some people that they can have it all on the line every single day, 
and it doesn't bother him a bit. That would just drive me nuts. I need to have some security yeah. built in, and it sounds to me like you're similar in that respect. Yes, I, I would say that. I mean, I, I know there has been times in my, my short two years out of college where mm-hmm. it was kind of like, hey, we're, we're playing the river right now. Everything's <laughs> on the table. We're all in on the pot. And uh-huh. We're waiting for that last card. But I think that it's better – uh, a better thought process if you know that you have some spot that you can take a step back and say, okay, we're good. Um, let's go and conquer the world a different way. Yeah, it's interesting when, especially when I was first beginning and when we were getting serious about this, because I had I had set my goal to have my own farm when I was about 19, 18 or 19 years old. And my vision of what it was going to be has changed. Actually, my vision of what it will be has grown. Uh, I had a small vision back then. But uh, as I got closer and closer uh, to my wife and I finally buying our farm and finally kind of reaching at least that first stage of what will be our agricultural journey, uh, as I was doing that, I was I was doing a, and social media had come along by then. That tells you how old I am. But anyway, social media had come <laughs> along by then, and I was I was out there and I was posing questions to people on social media. More often than not, when you put something out there on social media about how should I get started farming or this or that, you get a lot of negative mm-hmm. feedback. You get a lot of people who aren't doing it anymore. They wanted to do it. It didn't work out. And they, yep. they they discourage people from doing it because they had a bad experience. And I don't know that that ever really influenced me, but it does. it is in the back of my mind that since we purchased our farm and since we bought it right, that if for some reason this just totally does not work out, it, it, for some reason it goes awry, I do have a plan B. I don't necessarily have mm-hmm. to be that person uh, at some point who's on Facebook or on Twitter or something like that telling people don't even try it, don't even do it, go get a job in a, in a cubicle with air conditioning. I won't be that guy because if, if it all goes yep. if it all goes bad and I have to leave it, um, I, at least I'll be able to sell an asset that's appreciated over time, which is our land, and I can walk away with something exactly. positive. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting point. Exactly. Well, Josh, I, I really, you know, when I saw your, your profile on LinkedIn and I, I saw your age and I saw where you're going, I always think it's really informative. Uh, for So I'm twice your age. Well, I'm almost twice your age. I'm pretty darn close. I'm, I'm 46. But I think it's so informative for me to talk to somebody in your stage of the game because I remember where I was two years after I finished my ag degree. And, um, Mm -hmm. it's, and how excited and enthusiastic I was, the visions that I had, the things I was thinking about that, uh, people that were double my age were not thinking about. I think it's super informative to have somebody on, on the show like yourself and just talk about your vision and talk about where you want to go and to hear your enthusiasm, which has certainly come through. I really do appreciate you coming on and and being well, willing to share with us your goals and your plans and, and where you want this to go. And, and, to that, uh, with you saying that you are actively seeking a new opportunity, if somebody listening to this, if they think they've got an opportunity where you would be a good fit, how would you want them to contact you? Um, I mean, my cell phone, my email, they're all listed on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're someone that's not on LinkedIn yet, my email is just joshuadowell111 at gmail.com. Um, try to keep it simple. And even if it's somebody that doesn't necessarily have a, a job, you know, open or anything like mm-hmm. that. If you just want to talk about what the future looks like, uh, that's something I love discussing with people. It's absolutely one of the things that I love to do. Okay. And I will link up to all of that on the show notes. So anybody who wants to find any of those three ways to contact you, they can come to my website if they want. Another question for you, as we were talking, you sound, and there's nothing wrong with this, uh, nothing wrong with this at all, but you sound very centered and focused on California. Uh, are you yes. Are you limiting yourself to opportunities that are in California, or are you willing to go outside of those borders? Uh, so I'm not limiting myself, but in the, when it all boils down to it at the end of the day, uh, it's something that you won't hear from a lot of Californians right now because <laughs> there's just this mass exodus of us. Right. But, uh, and, and again, I, I'm not trying to brag on California, but we have some of the most productive land on the planet. Uh, and I, even though everything looks like it's going against us, I'm 100% bullish on our future. I think that things will turn around. 
uh, and I want to be a part of that process. So I'm not saying I'm not willing to relocate for a temporary amount of time, but I mm-hmm. definitely am looking to, to be a part of that positive change. I've talked so much about where I grew up and in my home state. Very good. Well, good for you. I, I fled California. You're sticking, you're, you're fighting the good fight and you're staying behind, uh, to see the future. And I'm, I'm trying. I, 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 uh, I, I always tell people I didn't retreat. I just fell back. That's what I tell people. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but you're yeah. staying there and, uh, you see that future there in California. So good for you. And boy, do I hope you're right. I really do hope you're right. California is a fantastic state and, uh, they've got, I, I've seen a lot of change in that state for the negative. That's why I left. But, uh, if mm-hmm. you, if you boiled it down to its core and to its roots and into its foundation, man, what a wonderful place. Exactly. And that's why I, I do think that even though things have gone awry, uh, that there is a there is a light at the end of this dark tunnel. I really do. And I'm going to stick it out and see what I can find at the end of it. Awesome. Well, Josh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing this today. Really, really enjoyed the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. Love having you here. I had a great conversation with Josh. Uh, in the show notes, uh, especially on the website, which is offincome.com. I'll have all of his contact information if you would like to contact him. Really appreciate you all being here. And as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.